So in this video, I want us to explore the sequential model a, a little bit more. Just delve slightly deeper, slightly deeper level. It's all about becoming familiar with what is possible. Now, if this is the first video that you see in this playlist, I would really urge you to go back to the start. Watch this playlist for the, from the start. I'm a surgeon. I'm involved in research as far as deep neural networks are concerned. And this series really is about deep neural networks for domain experts. So you're not necessarily a computer scientist or statistician. You are an expert in a field outside of that, but you want to get involved with deep learning. This is a course, a series, a playlist on YouTube to get you to become comfortable and familiar with deep neural networks. And we're using TensorFlow as our back end, Keras on top of that, and we're using the R programming language for statistics, a beautiful environment, an easy environment to start learning about deep neural networks. So we're at a stage where we've played before, we've used TF runs as far as re really is the tensor board uh, playing with that. Let's delve a little bit deeper and I've got, we can see up here, it's very small, but you'll see the tabs, model one, model two, and model three already created. But let's first get to grips with what's going on. I'm going to set as always my working directory. I'm going to hold down control and hit enter, command and enter. So we're going to accept that. I'm going to import Keras and I'm also going to import Plotly, but I'm just suppressing the messages so that I don't get all those yellow messages at the bottom here. So we're going to have Keras and Plotly here. Now let's import a data set. I'm going to use one of the inbuilt data sets inside of Keras and it's the MNIST data set. Now I just want to move here. I'm going to go onto my other monitor. Let's bring this up. There's the MNIST. In case you haven't heard about it, it really is famous. It's the easiest data set. Uh, by that I don't mean easy for a computer to learn, but to explain things. So there are many of these handwritten digits. They tiny, tiny little files. It's 28 by 28 pixel pixels, it's monochrome. So every pixel in this 28 by 28, I mean, remember how big the photos are that your phone can take. So these are really tiny. 28 by 28 and every pixel of that 28 is just one after the other, 28 in, a, in one column after the other, and then next row, next row, next row. It's just between 0 and 255, 255 being a bright white pixel, 0 being a pitch black pixel and there's this gray, all the grays in between. So it just gives a value at each of these 28 times 28 pixels. And each of these are looked at by a human being and a human being has marked all of these that that's a six, that's a six, that's a six. And then you want the computer to learn what if, if I give it one of these, what it is. So that's that's what we're after. Now the best way to do images is not through a normal multi-layer perceptron, a densely connected neural network. A better way to go about it is a convolutional neural network, and we are very close to start looking at convolutional neural networks. We are not there yet, so I'm going to do something something with this data set that will still allow us just to use our normal uh, normal densely connected neural network, our, our multi-layer perceptron. So let's have a look at this, and I'm going to use my normal function that we have or the, the symbol that we have here, uh, this uh, percent with a backward arrow percent, and it's the data set underscore MNIST, that's our function. And we're going to import that and it's very nicely written in Keras that I can immediately split it up, done all for me. So I'm using C uh, to have these two list of this list of lists and inside of that I have X train and Y train, that's my uh, X train would just be my training set and my training labels, my test set, and my test labels, and that's what I've called them. My uh, objects I've called X underscore train, Y underscore train. So it's going to take a second or two, but let's import that. There we go. Now let's have a look at the dimensions. I'm just calling dim on X train, and we right here at the bottom we see there are 60,000 and then 28 and 28. So this is a, a tensor. We, it's not just a, a or I should say rank two tensor, it's not just a rank one tensor, where, or a rank two tensor, I should say, where it's just the matrix of rows and columns, we've added another dimension to make this a rank two tensor. So it's 60,000 images of 28 times 28. Now what I want to do, now think of that 28, it's 
one after the other after the others in the first row so that we have 28 pixels in the first row we jump to the second one 28 but all what we could do is just make them all into one long vector so 28 times 28 is 784 so i'm changing this into something that has 60,000 60,000 rows and 784 columns and that's 784 columns so each sample in that one long row is just all the 28 times 28 pixel values in one long row and that's what we're doing with array underscore reshape it's a function and it's going to take x train and it's going to reshape it into this row and column so the columns are easy it's 28 times 28 that's 784 but the rows are a bit different you have to call the number of rows of x train and put that inside of our c function there and we're going to do the, exactly the same with x test so that now if we look at the dimensions we see 60,000 rows for x train across 784 columns as simple as that now we need to normalize remember we need to bring them all down and the way that we're going to normalize this is not by doing a standardizing it by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation it's because we have this very gradual very linear from 0 to 255 all we're going to do is we're going to use broadcasting by dividing every value by the maximum which is 255 so every every pixel value is now just going to be some fraction between 0 and 1 of what it was because we're just dividing each of them by 255 so that's one way of normalizing our feature set our feature variables which we haven't seen before so let me let's just look at what train number one was uh, our training label and our training data set what the first label was in uh, as far as the targets concerned yeah it was a five so now we're just going to do one hot encoding remember that's the two categorical function inside of Keras and uh, because it's from 0 to 9 the handwritten digits there are 10 of them so I'm using 10 as an argument and we're going to do both of those so let's look at what 5 was so I'm going to call y train 1 uh, the row 1 comma sp space there to show me all the columns and look at this 0 0 0 0 0 1 so if I count from 0 0 1 2 3 4 5 the 5 is one hot on one hot encoded so indeed that 5 is now represented by this 10 element vector of which the fifth one here with a starting from zero is one hot encoded excellent now let's import tf runs so that we can actually have our tensor board to look at these and i'm going to call mnist underscore model underscore one dot r let's open it up and let's see what this one was all about because i promised you we're going to delve slightly deeper into the sequential model what can we add and the first thing that's going to pop out here is this callbacks we haven't seen callbacks before and i want to introduce you to callbacks here so my model is just going to be a keras underscore model underscore sequential we've seen this before i'm going to use my pipe symbol here so i'm going to pipe model as the first argument to layer dense so i'm going to have one two dense layers here and then a third dense layer my first dense layer 256 units that's fairly conservative remembering that i have 784 columns so i'm going down from remember right at the beginning we drew all these circles with all the lines in between them i'm going from an input vector of size 784 to down to 256 the, my, my first hidden layers only got 256 nodes whereas my input had 784 so that's dropping down quite a bit my activation function would be a rectified linear unit and remember for that first layer you've got to tell tensorflow or keras in this instance then what the input shape is and that's 784 it's got to accept that from there it'll infer how big uh, the the weight matrix is the ma weight tensor that it has to multiply so my second one drops down even further to 128 rectified linear units my activation my last one is 10 units and i'm going to use a soft max i've got to use soft max because i want a probability for 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7, 8 9 and the one that has the maximum probability that's going to be the uh, predicted value uh, for that handwritten digit then i'm going to compile the model my loss is going to be a categorical cross entropy as we should do uh, in this type of problem my optimizer is going to be rms prop we've seen that video what rms prop is all about my metric is going to be accuracy and then i'm finally going to fit my model with x train and y train i'm going to run my mini batches uh, 256 rows over 50 epochs now let's get to callbacks you pass a list of all the callbacks that you want and i'm only going to do one callback here and the callback is early stopping early stopping means it's going to run you know that we're going to see this graph on the right hand side 
But when it sees that no, no, something is happening, it's going to terminate the learning process. And the arguments that we're going to use there is what to monitor and for how long. So monitor, in this instance, I'm going to monitor the loss. Because I pass validation data to this, I could have just loss or I could have val underscore loss, or I could also monitor the accuracy or the validation accuracy. I've chosen loss as my simple example here. And my second argument here is patience. So every time a loss comes up, it's going to look at two beyond that because I've set it to two. And if my loss doesn't decrease, then for two mini batches in a row, it is going to say, halt, stop the bus. We're not learning anything more. Exit from this, I'm stopping. And that is what this callback is all about. I'm still going to set my verbosity to 2 and my validation data. I'm going to use my test data as my validation data. So that's model number one. And I just have to write it out like this. I don't have to import Keras. It's all going to come from here and from the TF runs. So let's run this training run for that model. And because we've set the working directory and these models all live in the same directory, I can just use the name .r. I don't have to type in the full address. So let's run that. And we can see in this instance, so I can do the recording and post this to our pubs. I'm not using my GPU. I'm running this off of the CPU, so it's a bit slow. But we can certainly see things starting to happen there. You can see the little zigzag pattern there in my validation data set. It probably means that, remember, that my, my mini batch size is too small and that we get this noise inside of it going up and down, up and down, depending on the specific data inside of that mini batch. We can smooth this out by making the mini batch size, the batch size as it's called as an argument, slightly bigger. Now let's just, while this runs, just talk for a moment about the base truth that we have here. This was done by a human being. We're gonna accept that the base accuracy here, the human level accuracy was very close to 100%. So if we think about our variance and our bias, and we look at this, uh, certainly we're getting very close to 100% in our training set, so that's going very well. But there's, there's between that and what we expect the ground truth to be, the real truth is very small. And so we, we're probably dealing with a bit of variance here, a bit of overfitting, and we have to do something about that. But we've called TF runs and we've got called train data, so we get this beautiful TensorBoard illustration. But look what's happened. We see this early termination here because of our callback. So it recognized that for two steps in a row, there was no increase in, in the accuracy. Uh, or was it loss? Now I can't remember what I called. Let's have a quick look. We used loss. So I didn't see that the loss got less for two after one was called, so it terminated early. No problem whatsoever. And that's very good. It's very good to set that so that you don't sit with bigger models. I mean, all of these are toy models that we've dealt with. You don't want to sit for days and have something run and nothing really is happening. Your model's not making any improvement. So to put these callbacks in, very, very good thing to do. So let's just go to our second model. Let's see what we did there. So what we've done, it's a bit more restrictive. 128. So, so that space, I'm really, that hypothesis space, I'm shrinking it down and I'm also doing a bit of dropout. 0.2 there. So I'm adding these two dropout layers there. I'm using RMS props still. I'm still using my callbacks so nothing's changed. So this, there wasn't, I don't know if one can really call this that there was high variance, but between what we assume to be this baseline of 100% accuracy as the labels were done, the training data got very close to that, but then there was this gap oh, slightly to, um, to the test data, the validation set. So let's try and improve that by constricting our hypothesis space a little bit, just for fun. Basically, as a reminder, this, I haven't introduced anything new, but let's run this model. And we can see training is, a, is going on. We can see quite slow, Remember, I'm running this off of a Core i7 Intel processor, so it's not running off of my GPU. So it's going slowly, but we're certainly getting there. And we can see our model there went right to the end. So it did the callback did not terminate. It didn't have to, didn't find this re reason with the patients being set to, to, to terminate early. So we see 
uh, this whole run taking place over all 50 epochs. So let's compare these two runs. We've seen that before. And now we can see the two runs. So let's look at this accuracy. It really for the training set went up to 99, 98 for validation. And here it was uh, on this side. Let's have a look. Yes, on this side it was 99, 98. So certainly you must always have a look at the scale. It's deceptive, this y-axis, very bad. And so just look at that. So as I say, we, we haven't really improved this and, and, and whether we should call this high variances, that's also debatable. But it's about the principle, you get it. And then we can see the changes we made. We went from 256 to 128. All the greens are the new ones. We introduced a dropout layer there and et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at model number three. Something new I want to show you here as well. So we've got our constricted model still, we've got the dropouts, etc. And now when we get to compiling in the optimizer, before we would have just put Adam inside of quotation marks. What you do there is you just accept all the default values. And in the next video, if I have time, I might show you an easy way after creating your model, how to get to what all the defaults were. It's very easy to do. But here, we, we, instead of just using all the defaults by putting Adam inside of quotation marks, I can actually use the proper function. It's called optimizer underscore Adam, which allows me to add some of these default, uh, the default values or change them even. So if I just hover there, it's tiny. You're probably not going to see this on your YouTube video, but it says there learning rate 0.001. So I've changed that to learning rate being 0.003. There's beta underscore one, beta underscore two. We've spoken about that before. We have an epsilon there, a decay rate, an AMS grad, clip norm, clip values, etc. So I've changed three of the arguments there. And that is how we drill down deeper into the sequential model, where we start manipulating things to our heart's content. And it is so easy to do. So there we go. A lovely example of drilling a bit deeper. So instead of using the the default values by just using the name, and this for, for Adam, it would just be Adam in, in inverted commas. I'm actually using the function uh, optimize underscore Adam so that I can manipulate the arguments that go with that. So that's beautiful. That is something new. So let's just run this model three. Now, while that runs to the end, I'm going to stop the video here. We can just compare them. It's going to show us the comparison. You've seen that before. But now you've seen drilling down a bit deeper, getting a bit more finesse, taking more control over your, your sequential models.